You know what I like best about candles? Not is it not only are they beautiful, but that candle can light this candle. And that candle can light this candle. And that candle can light that candle. And before you knew it, know it, everybody's got the light. From 1 John chapter 2. I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother or sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. Our job is to share the light with our brothers and sisters. Let us worship together now. Well, good morning. I am so glad to be with you this morning and welcome you to worship at St. Luke's. Our mission here is to help you live and love like Jesus. And so it is my prayer that through this worship service, you will feel closer to God, that you'll mold your life a little bit more after Jesus, and that you might share God's love with everyone that you encounter. We have a lot of awesome things that are happening right now at the church, and so I want to be sure to tell you about them. The first is that today is our fall gathering. We are going to do this as a virtual church conference, and so you can live stream it today at 4 p.m. You can either go to our website, and there will be a button on the homepage that says fall gathering, or if you don't have the St. Luke's app already, this is a great time to download it. We will be streaming it through the app. This is our opportunity to tell you a little bit about what's going on at the church, give you a state of the church, talk about our finances, hear about all of the exciting things that we have coming up, and we're also going to talk about a return to in-person worship. And so I really hope that you will plan to join us for that. Next Sunday is World Communion Sunday. It is a day in which we take communion every year um, and are joined by all of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. And so we are going to celebrate that by taking communion in a drive-in communion in our parking lot like we did a few months ago. Uh, and so I hope that you will make plans to join us for that. It is a great way to see people, get a chance to wave at your friends and say hi from church that you haven't seen in a while. And it's also a reminder that Christianity is not just for those of us in this service or at this church, but for everyone. That when we take the Lord's Supper together, we are reminded that that table stretches really long and that we are joined with people all over the world. So next month, we also have a bunch of women's events coming up that we are so excited about. It's called the Month of Revive. If your soul is feeling depleted, you might be like me and you might be looking for a way to revive it. And uh, we have an awesome calendar of things that you can do. So they range from in-depth spiritual discussions to a book club. We're going to do a, a service project with an in-person consecration worship. We have some uh, workshops like art and flower arranging and revolution wellness. Wellness, and we have a keynote and Q&A from the New York Times bestselling author, Melanie Schenkel. And so all of these events are free. It's a great way to invite your friends to do something with you during this time. I hope that you will go on our website. Uh, there is information on the screen right now and in the chat with how you can find out more and register for those events. And then finally, if you have been visiting St. Luke's for a while and you just want to find out what this is all about, if you want to become a member of this church or if you just want to learn more about it, I hope you'll join us for coffee with the pastor that's next Sunday afternoon. There is information on the screen and in the chat uh, with a way for you to register. But this is a great opportunity to learn more about the church, meet some of the staff. We do this virtually, and we would love to welcome you as a member to St. Luke's. I'm so grateful to the Serenas and the Pichos for sharing that story with us. One of the greatest parts of my job is that I get to witness all of the friendships that are made and forged here at St. Luke's. There's something about studying together and praying together and volunteering together that I think just binds our hearts to one another in a deeper way. And I hope that you've experienced that blessing of friendship at St. Luke's. We have a lot of ways that you can get involved if that is something that you are looking to deepen. And I hope you'll just reach out to me and let me know. And I'd be so glad to chat with you about how you can do that. Now, today's scripture text is about friendship as well. It's from 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 5, about the friendship between David and Jonathan. Please listen as I read. When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. 
Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. As a result, Saul set him over the army and all the people, even the servants of Saul, approved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Gracious God, you alone are worthy of our praise. And so we have come to worship this morning, not only to hear words that transform us, but to be filled with your grace and your hope. We pray that we have come not out of habit, but to respond to your call. We pray that that will take us away from the easy, familiar path that we like so much. Because we know that you have called us to lay aside everything that distracts us and to follow you into service to others. And you've invited us to draw other people into service so that we might work side by side to redeem your creation. Let us be a balm to those who are hurting, giving comfort through our words and through our presence. Let us bring peace to those who are anxious by sharing your goodness and love with them and by sharing their burdens. Give us eyes to see where justice and compassion may be offered. We lift up now the names of those who weigh heavy on our hearts and pray that you would show us how we can be like Christ to them. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time of offering, if you would like to make a gift, you can do so by texting the number on your screen or clicking the link in the chat. These gifts help us to continue to serve our neighbors in the community and to do ministry here with adults and students and children. I pray that you will be reminded, not just today, but throughout the week, that it is in our entire lives that we offer to God as a gift. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Let's uh, begin our sermon time together with a prayer. Gracious God, open us up to whatever it is you have for us today. Open our eyes that we might see and open up our ears that we might hear your word that's uh, in the midst of of these words. Uh, Open up our hearts, God, that we might experience your compassion. And then, O Lord, open our hands that we might serve. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, this is... uh, a beautiful and poignant and powerful story in the Old Testament, the story of David and Jonathan. Let me just tell you the the whole story because that's really what makes it uh, most powerful. Um, uh, You remember last week we talked about how uh, David um, had come into Saul's service uh, playing the lyre and um, being his armor bearer and serving him and then and then uh, stood up and spoke these words of faith uh, about, about Goliath, the, Phil- the Philistine. And Saul really liked David. He really liked him. And it, it just, he brought him into his home to live in his home. Now, Jonathan was Saul's son. And so that meant that David and Jonathan kind of lived like brothers in, in the household of, of Saul. But after Goliath uh, was slain, uh, something, something snapped inside Saul. And he heard the people singing that uh, Saul has, has killed his thousands, but David tens of thousands. And the praise was greater for David than for, for Saul. And this evil spirit of jealousy wells up inside him. And he decides it's time to have uh, David killed. Well, Jonathan has uh, built a friendship with David, and uh, this friendship is something that is is a powerful thing. 
And so three times as, as uh, Saul thinks of and tries to kill David, uh, his, his own son, Jonathan, intercedes. So the first time he simply just goes to Saul and says, don't you realize what he did for you when he, when he took care of, of Goliath, the Philistine? And Saul thinks about it and says, yes, yes, he's been good for us. And he says, I'm not going to kill him. But somehow then this, this spirit of jealousy wells up inside of him and he throws his spear at David as if to kill him. So the second time that happens after uh, a weeks go by is that David has, has fled, but then come back into the house of Saul. And Jonathan is trying to figure out how to get him out, how to get him to escape. And so when he discovers that uh, Saul is indeed going to try and kill David again, they hatch this elaborate plan for uh, David to escape. The, they don't see each other again. At the, at the, after that, um, when, they, when they leave there, here's what it says. And this is uh, 1 Samuel 20. He bowed three times, and they kissed each other and wept with each other, and David wept the more. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, since both of us has sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. The third uh, time that Jonathan interceded for David was uh, years later when David is in the wilderness of Ziph. And uh, indeed, Saul is going after him again. And Jonathan discovers that and goes and finds Saul's uh, uh, David's camp and warns him that Saul is on his way and is coming uh, to kill him. And that's the last time they see each other. And the scripture says, the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and then Jonathan went home, and David remained in Horesh. So three times he has interceded on behalf of, of David. Well, uh, years later, Saul and Jonathan are both killed in battle on Mount Gilboa. Uh, there's not really, uh, there's some lack of clarity on how Saul died, whether he took his own life or whether he um, uh, convinced an Amalekite to kill him. But both of them die, and when David finds out about their deaths, he is just heartbroken. And he weeps for Saul and especially for his friend uh, for his friend Jonathan. And he writes a, a song that's called the Song of the Bow. And it is a beautiful song in which he um, talks about his love for, for Jonathan and the friendship that they shared. So all uh, often, Jonathan is lifted up as this biblical example of what friendship can be like. We're in this uh, series on sharing the light. And, and one of the ways that we can uh, share God's light with others is through friendship, through uh, uh, offering others this gift of God's friendship. So let's uh, take a look at this uh, passage and see what we might learn about how we can do that. Here's the first thing that jumped out uh, at me. <laughs> it's just sort of obvious. David needed a friend. Uh, David is in the house of Saul. Um, he, he is never sure whether his, his uh, life is in danger at any given moment, and he needed a friend. Uh, he had allies. He had acquaintances. He had cheerleaders singing, David has killed his tens of thousands. But what he really needed was a friend. Look, we uh, all around us, there are people who need friends. And why? Because we were built for, we were created for friendship. Um, when, when we're born, we, we have been in someone else's body for nine months, constantly hearing another heartbeat all the time. I mean, think about that. We, we, and, and then all of a sudden when we're born, we're immediately dependent upon other people. We're made to be in relationship with others. We're not meant to be on our own lone wolves. You know, in, in uh, the book of Genesis, we have the story of creation. And uh, God creates all of the world in Genesis 1. And, he, and after each day of creation, it says, and it was good. 
and it was so good, and he creates the human being. Oh, it was so good. In Genesis 2, though, we have the very first time that the scripture says there was something that was not good. Here's what it says. It is not good that the man should be alone. Right? We were not meant to be alone. Now, often people think about this as about marriage or about having a spouse, about man and woman, and it's there. I'm not saying it's not there. But I think it's a much broader statement to say it is not good that the man should be alone. He does go ahead and make uh, what one pastor refers to as the new improved human being, the woman out of the man. But uh, I think it's really about the whole point of the story is that we're created to be in relationship, in, in friendship. And we're living in a time when people are having fewer and fewer friends. And there is a, a, an emptiness in so many people's lives because of that lack of friendship. A few years ago in the United Kingdom, a woman named Sue Bourne put out a documentary called The Age of Loneliness. You've probably heard for many years people talking about the age of anxiety, that we live in the age of anxiety. But this is um, uh, the age of, of loneliness. And she, uh, she develops all sorts of, of ways of helping us understand how friendships have sort of slipped down our, um, our level of priorities. And there are a lot of reasons for that. We just live in a different kind of society. So for example, it, it used to be that when you were, you were born and you grew up in the same town and you, you really didn't leave, uh, uh, leave that town. But now um, only about 20% of the people live in the same town that they were born in or that they grew up in. Um, and on the average, uh, people in the U.S., on the average, people move 11.7 times in their lives. Now, sometimes that's just from one house to another house, but they're moving 11.7 times. So you build all these friendships in your neighborhood, and then you move. And now you got to go find, make new friends in your neighborhood. It, it, it's a problem at our work lives, too. It used to be that you would stay in the same job most of your life, or maybe you'd be in two jobs, or maybe three over the course of a career. But now uh, most millennials will, will find a new job about every three years. So there's this continual movement. So you build all these friends at work and these people that you finally begin to trust, and then you got to go someplace new. And it's great to get that feeling of a new start, but um, sometimes we just, it's hard for us to build those friendships that take time uh, to, uh, to mature and to gel um, uh, together. And so at, at the end, then at the end of our lives, our end of our careers, what do we do? We retire and all of our work friends, we used to get up in the morning, go to work and we see them every day and now uh, we don't see them, right? We're retired. And we were with our family or some, some other people, or hopefully we're able to make some friends in the community or we've built friendships along the way we can hold on to. But uh, the truth is, it's just, it's just hard. A friendship is, it's hard work. And we're gonna talk about that more in a minute. The truth is that um, we all need friends and that there are so many people out there in the world around us that need friends. Albert Einstein uh, made this such an interesting uh, comment. He said, it is strange to be known so universally and yet be so lonely. In the midst of his fame, to say I'm known so universally and yet I'm, I'm so lonely. There, is, there are many people around who are, are lonely. Now here's why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you because uh, it may be that, that you are thinking to yourself, I have all the friends I need. I'm, I'm, I'm doing well with my friendships. I, you know, I feel like I've got good friendships around and I'm, I'm, I'm healthy in that. And I've, I've worked hard on those relationships. Well, what if it isn't about you? <laughs> what, what if it's about all those other people who are anxious, who need, who, who are living in that darkness of loneliness? and are hungry for someone to share with them the light of friendship. David needed a friend, and Jonathan was that friend. 
Here's the second thing I see. Jonathan made that friendship happen through sacrifice and effort. <laughs> here's uh, here's the, what the, the whole message of today's sermon is. If you want a summary, it's pretty easy, and you know it especially if you were a Girl Scout. Make new friends and keep the old. One is silver and the other is gold. Right? Um, Jonathan chose to invest himself in David's life and to sacrifice so that that friendship could happen. We like to think that friendships just are sort of magic, right? That you have this, this moment of affinity with someone and, you know, you click and then you're these great friends. And that, that actually seems to be kind of what happened with Jonathan, Jonathan and David, that uh, Jonathan saw David and uh, just thought um, he wanted to be his friend, and then he went after it and made that happen. But when you read the scripture, what you see is this, is this investment of himself, this sacrifice of his own, his own needs, um, these risks that he's willing to take in order to, to forge this friendship with uh with David. I'm going to listen, listen to uh, what the scripture itself says. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe he was wearing, sort of his position in the kingdom, and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. He, he took all of his, the, the instruments of his life, all of the uh, status that he had and conferred it on, um, on David. He invested himself. Now, well, what is it we have to invest? Well, first we have to make a sacrifice of time, right? Uh, for friendship to really happen, we have to spend the time investing in that. So, uh, Rick Warren was talking about friendship and I got tickled. He said, you know what it means when someone says, well, I'll be there in spirit. I can't be there actually, but I'm gonna be with you in spirit. Here's what it means, he said, it means nothing. It means nothing. He said, if you, if you say, and people say this to me all the time, if you say you don't have time for friendship, then you don't have enough time. Then, then you, you don't have time for a life that's fulfilling and significant because that's what God's given us as friendships, being fulfilling and, and significant. It means that we have to have a, a sacrifice of the heart. Here's why a lot of the times that we choose not to make friends, because uh, we don't want to put ourselves out there. We're afraid that either we'll get hurt by somebody, they won't want to be our friend after all, or that we won't like them and, um, and they'll be too needy, or we think we're not going to be a good friend to them and we're going to let them down. And so rather than risk that, um, those perils of intimacy, we just say, I'm going to be self-sufficient. And you know, I've got the friends that I have, and those are, those are really stable friendships. And I, I can trust that I'm, I'm, none of these things are going to happen. They're not going to hurt me, and I'm not going to hurt them, and, and I can be comfortable in those. So I'm not going to take that risk to step out there into this uh, uh, risky new uh, relationship. And um, again, here's, here's what that means. It means that you, you are not able to carry the light of friendship into the people's lives around you uh, who need that, that light of, of friendship. So too often we're just afraid, afraid to uh, do the work uh, to take that risk. Here's the third thing I see in this. Jonathan sustained that friendship through, uh, against all these odds, um, through covenant. <laughs> Remember um, what I said the basic theme of today's sermon is, make new friends and keep the old. So not only do we have to make a new friendship, but, but we have to continue to invest in the friendships we do have um, and, and to con continue to renew that uh, through through covenant. Here's what here's what the uh, uh, scripture says. The two, this is in when in the wilderness of Ziph. So uh, the years have gone by. Uh, they made a covenant with one another um, when when Jonathan helped David escape. 
And now, they're, now the years have gone by, and, and David is, uh, Jonathan is warning David in the wilderness of Ziph. And at the end of it, the last time they see each other, the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horesh. They made a covenant. They renewed the covenant that they'd made. You know, um, the scripture in jo- uh uh, Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times. And I, I've looked up the word there for all in Hebrew, and it means all, <laughs> all the time. That there is a constancy to friendship that is able to uh, survive the ups and downs that come in life over the years. And, and that those friendships uh, are maintained. Um, Last week I went to see a friend. We've been friends for 25 years, and now he's very sick and uh, is in hospice care at home and um, is having difficulty getting up off the couch. And uh, well, we sat and talked for an hour and, um, and until he was just worn out, I'm sure. And we laughed and we talked about important things and we remembered things we'd been through together and. Um, things he'd done for me, and um, I thanked him for those, and he thanked me for things uh, I'd done for him, and there was just this, um, there was just this sense of connection with one another that had been tempered over all of the years, and the truth is there would be some years we never spoke to each other. It wasn't like we, you know, emailed back and forth every day, but but the strength of that friendship was so powerful and, and beautiful. Uh, there's, a, there's a word, I think, for it in Scripture, and that word is love, right? There's, there's, there's something powerful about that bond that can withstand um, all of the ups and downs of, of the years. I have another friend who um, is just uh, persistent and relentless in reaching out to me and maintaining our friendship. And I'm sad to say I don't always reciprocate as well, Uh, but I'm I'm, I'm so um, helped, I'm so supported by the ongoing persistent uh, sense of investment into our relationship. This covenant between us, this sense of promise one to another that we'll be there in all times. We'll support one another in all times. Frederick Buechner is one of my favorite authors, and um, when he writes about Jonathan and David, uh, their relationship together, here's, here's what he says. What's important about their relationship was its affection, respect, and faithfulness that kept it alive through thick and thin until finally Jonathan was killed in battle and David rent his garments and wept over him. The the lifelong friendships that we can give to one another, some of them forged here at the church, some of them forged at work, some of them forged in your neighborhood, but to choose to invest one another over in one another over time. All right, here's here's the last thing I see here that um, this scripture teaches me. That that Jonathan uh, brought the presence of God into their relationship. Here's what he said at the very uh, at the very beginning when they have been uh, when he's helping David escape for the first time. Both of us has have sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, "The Lord shall be between me and you, between my descendants and your descendants, forever." So the, the, the truth is that as David, uh, Jonathan, brought into their relationship the presence of God, that gave David a, a, a friend and support that could be with him when Jonathan could not. Um, John uh, Payton was a missionary in, um, in the South Pacific. And after he had gone to... Uh, to serve there for the first time, his wife was with him and she died uh, three months after he got there. And he just felt, 
he was in this strange place and didn't know the customs well yet and was trying to get by and then his wife dies of disease. And um, here's what he said. If it had not been for Christ and his friendship, I should have gone mad and died beside that lonely grave. To, to have been given the gift of friendship with Christ is, is perhaps the greatest gift of all. Sam Johnson um, was a representative from Texas, um, the Dallas area, and he uh, died in May of this last year, this year. And uh, he was a, a prisoner of war in Vietnam for seven and a half years. At some one point, um, I think a, a cellmate of, of John McCain. But for many of those years, he was part of a group that was kept in solitary confinement. So he, he wouldn't actually see anyone else. He would see no other human being for years on end. That will make, I mean, that now is, uh, is considered to be torture. It is, it, it, it was, he said, the, just the most difficult thing of all. He he's wrote an autobiography um, uh, about his experience um, there called Captive Warriors. And in it, he said that the one thing that kept him alive was a friendship with Christ, was knowing that he wasn't alone. Right, that he that he was connected to that one friend who would be there with him no matter what, even when he was completely alone. Uh, I've told you before about my friend Mark Graham, who's a, a pastor in Illinois. Uh, our friendship really isn't so much as pastors. Um, he he introduced me to Jesus. He approached me in the high school cafeteria, invited me on a youth retreat, and it was there that. Um, that he introduced me to Christ. And we became just fast friends when we were in high school together. And I admired him so much. And that the presence of Christ in the relationship between us was so awesome as, as the scripture says, the Lord between me and you forever and ever and our families forever and ever. We'll see what, how that plays out next week. But the best gift he gave me, the best gift, was a relationship with a friend who would always be there for me. My friendship with Christ. To know that, I, I, that there is someone who understands everything about me, who supports me in every way, who is willing to, uh, to speak truth to me, but at the same time accept me just as I am, to bring the best out in me. All of those things that a friend does, that Christ does for me. We can offer people the gospel when we befriend them. When we make a friend, uh, I, I always like to say that friendship is the portal through which the gospel is passed. Well, let me just, uh, let me just close uh, uh, with this. Sometimes when I do a memorial service, I'll be meeting with the family and they'll say something like, I say, well, is there anyone else other than me as the pastor that you'd like to speak? And I, I bet a few, maybe more than half of the people would like to have someone else speak. And sometimes people will say, yes, we have 27 friends that would like to speak at the service. I, I'm using hyperbole there, it's never 27, but there's sometimes a lot of them. And, uh, my initial reaction is, oh, come on. I mean, how many different things are they going to say? And then I think, well, aren't, are they just wanting to, to let people know that they were important to this person who died? And, but then when I really begin to talk to them, what I realize is that these were people who make new friends and keep the old. Because one is silver and the other is gold. And that over a lifetime, they've invested uh, sacrificed for others to build those friendships. And that there'd been a great payoff to them, but they'd also been an even greater payoff to others. You know, when we make great friends, our, our joys are doubled because we have someone to share them with and our sorrows are cut in half because there's someone to bear them with us. 
in, in your orbit, in your orbit, there is someone who needs a friend, who needs you to bring the light of friendship into their lives. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's someone who, um, whose friends have betrayed them. Maybe it's, maybe it's someone who never had very many friends. Maybe it's someone who lost a loved one and those nights are, uh, without someone to talk to are just long and lonely and a phone call with a friend and laughter and tears together would mean all the difference. Who knows? But somebody in your orbit needs a friend and, and you can carry the light of friendship into their lives. Let's pray together. Gracious God, um, we thank you for the friends that you've put into our lives, for the people who have made sacrifices to be our friends, and the joy that we have in being to offer ourselves to others. God, we know that, that those friendships sometimes bring pain into our lives as we lose people we love. But God, there's nothing more significant, and we thank you so much that you've given us that gift of friendship. Show us the people around us who need, need us to be their friends, that we might share with them the light of friendship. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. So the benediction that I offer to y'all each week comes from Paul's letter to the Second Corinthians. It's chapter 13, verse 14. And I love this even in this season because Paul writes letters to his communities that he can't be with to send him his love and um, all of his hopes and his prayers. And so I feel like right now, even as we are not together, I hope that you will receive this benediction and know that it comes with a lot of hopes and love and prayer for all of you. So receive this benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.